Flight team stand up. Jimmy High Roller, he hit a buzzer beater and saved thousands of lives. Let's check it There's out. There's nothing else like it in basketball. A block. NBA season's almost underway. How y'all feeling? A steal. A game-saving shot. Is this the tender? Have you ever seen a life-saving play? No. This is McCall Riley, senior forward for the University of Alabama in the late 2000s. And late he's playing in the huh? SEC tournament. It's the biggest game of his life up to this point. Game on the line, down three, with two seconds left on the clock. And he's about to hit a shot that not only nearly saved this game for his team, but quite possibly saved the lives of thousands of people. Really? And how so? Uh, rocking a bit. No way. Situations like this. The uh, Dome Stadium is, is the best possible place that you could be. I hope you're right. Wait, what? Is this an out, outside of basketball or is it has to do? Today's video is sponsored by Day Action with King Spoiler Spoiler. The shot that saved lives. It's March 14th, 2008. It's day two of the SEC basketball tournament and Mississippi State is up on Alabama by three points, okay. 59 to 56. There's two seconds left on the clock. Alabama's gotta make something happen. With their season three points away from being over, Alabama draws up a play for this guy right here, our friend McCall Riley. Now, McCall was a great player, second leading scorer on this Alabama squad. But on this particular night, he was hot and cold the entire game. He got off to a slow start, but piled up 13 points in the final 12 minutes of the first half, followed up by a handful of misses and zero points in the entire second half, at least up to this point. This was McCall's last chance at this. He was a senior. His team was on the brink of elimination. His number was being called, and he answered. With their season on the line, McCall Riley rattles in a three-point buzzer beater to send the game into overtime. The fans explode. Oh, Mississippi nice State is stunned. This game's going into overtime. But right as overtime tipped off, fans at home noticed that their TVs were becoming distorted. The broadcast signal of the game degrading and getting worse. In that moment, they had no idea what was going on. But while something special was unfolding on the court, devastation was about to unfold just outside of it. Really? As overtime gets underway, there's an emergency report that a massive storm was building up just west of the Georgia Dome where the game was being played. Really? Within a few minutes, the storm had developed into an EF2 tornado with winds of up to 130 miles per hour. Oh, guys, if you don't know what that is, man, like, so it goes F1, F2, F3, F4, then F5 tornado. Like, F2, and he says it sounds like a pretty high F2. At the last second, Bro. At first, fans and players within the arena were unaware of what was going on outside. But very quickly, the situation became apparent to everyone. Mississippi State basket. G is fouled by Stewart. That's uh, my first time ever hearing about like this. And, uh, we're hearing some rumbling behind us. There's some concern. The building is uh, rocking a bit. The storm becoming so strong that it shook the arena and ripped through panels on the roof. Oh Fans in attendance gosh. that night said it sounded like a freight train was ripping through the roof of the arena. Ben Hansborough, Mississippi State guard and brother of former Tar Heel and NBA player Tyler Hansborough, said he thought he was hearing a tornado or a terrorist attack. Which is quite an odd combination of guesses, but the man didn't know what was going on, no. cut him some slack. Officials had to stop the game as the tornado ripped past the arena and the surrounding downtown area. Fans quickly began to head for the doors, but the arena staff told them they needed to stay inside. Because outside, it was far too dangerous to even try to get out of the building. And within a Damn. few minutes, the tornado had passed through, oh. causing more damage than the staff and engineers on site had initially thought. 
It wasn't until later that weather services were able to track the path of the tornado in its destruction, where they came to the bleak realization that this tornado came within just 100 yards of the arena, wiping out everything in its path downtown and causing a half a billion dollars in damage. Damn. The worst realization came a couple days after, when a body was found amongst the debris of the tornado, proving that this was a fatal event. But it could have been far more catastrophic. Well, exactly, because they just said that the game went into overtime based on that three-point shot. And so, if he missed that shot and the game readily ends in regulation, everybody would have just went and tried to just leave the game like everybody normally does when the game is over with. And imagine all those people, like, I'm going to say maybe roughly, like, the stadium packed out 15,000, 20,000 people, bro. You know how busy ATL is and stuff, bro. And they would have been out there, bro. That could have been the most catastrophic, like, after game, like, you know what I'm saying, catastrophe ever, bro. That is actually kind of insane. This is my first time ever hearing about if this. If McCall Riley did not hit his game-tying shot to send the game into overtime, nearly 20,000 fans would have exited the arena oh directly into the gosh. path. And at the exact moment the tornado hit, thousands of people would have been in danger. The downtown oh area that was gosh. wrecked by the tornado would have been filled with people. What could have unfolded in the following moments would have been devastating. But thanks to a buzzer beater, these fans stayed in their seats, safe and away from the storm. The game went into overtime and the streets were essentially empty. An unbelievable Damn. sequence of events that undoubtedly saved the Bro, lives. Bro, I didn't even get a lot of you. I didn't even know tornadoes actually happened in the downtown city of Atlanta. Maybe outside, because obviously we've been to ATL at least 10, 15 plus times in my entire life. And like, you know, the ATL like or just Georgia in general has an outside of stuff that's like country or, or just like outside of the outer city. And I never really thought like tornadoes actually hit like any type of city like areas. Like I just, I didn't even know that. That's actually insane, bro. Man. An unbelievable sequence of events that undoubtedly saved the lives of countless fans in attendance that night. About an hour after the tornado had passed, the game resumed, and finding themselves in an eerily similar situation as they were at the end of regulation, wow. Alabama went back to McCall for one last shot. This time, to win it all. And this time, he missed it. Oh! So close to leading his team to a playoff win and coming up short. Oh! McCall may not have hit the game-winning shot he was hoping for, but what he did do was something far greater because he hit possibly the first and only life-saving shot. No, seriously. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the butterfly effect. When one seemingly insignificant occurrence has rippling effects, leading to some consequential event, sometimes long after the initial event. And this is just one of many butterfly effects within the world of basketball that you have to see to believe. That's actually really insane. Like take the scholarship nearly 5,000 miles away from the u.s serbia has grown to become a hot spot for basketball talent despite their love for soccer and relatively small population their influence over the basketball world has been a remarkable feat over the last few decades and among the countless young serbian hopefuls looking to make a name for themselves in hoops it would eventually be darko milicic a player who didn't leave much of an impact on the court who would inadvertently alter the story of basketball forever not by himself but through a young kid who had no plans of even playing the sport. Back in 2006, Darko Milicic was beginning his fourth season in the NBA. And by this point, he had already been labeled as a huge draft bust. I remember this guy, I ain't gonna lie. He, he had already fallen said out it, of the but... rotation in Detroit. The hype of him being a generational prospect had long wore off. And, well, it didn't help that the multiple future Hall of Famers chosen after him in the draft were blossoming well ahead of schedule. On the court, he wasn't really able to offer the Pistons much at the time. But off the court, Darko had the opportunity to offer a fellow Serbian everything. That same year, Jay Smith, assistant coach of the University of Detroit Mercy, was looking for players to fill his roster. One of the players he had his sights on was a six foot six forward out of Serbia named Nemanja. Smith offered the kid a scholarship, but moving across the world to play basketball in the US was a massive leap for the young prospect. He could take the scholarship and make the move, or he could stay in Europe and take a shot at a career in professional basketball. Uncertain about what decision he should make, Nemanja got in touch with a friend and fellow Serbian-born player well, I not who know had how to already use that made a similar phone, transition from his home country to play basketball in the States, Darko Milicic. 
Now, Milicic not only assured Nemanja that he should take the opportunity, he also took him into his home and gave him time to acclimate to American life without being on his own. And over the course of that season, their friendship grew. Nemanja would go to Pistons games, throw parties at Darko's house, and even had access to the resources Darko had gained in his time in the NBA. Darko had created an entry point to American basketball for Nemanja that otherwise wouldn't have existed. Unbeknownst to him, nearly a decade later, his generosity would aid another young Serbian prospect with his journey to the U.S. After finishing his college career, Nemanja played one season in the Premier Basketball League in the U.S. before moving back home to play professionally in Serbia, where he played his last season in 2012. A relatively unremarkable career to most fans, but one that sparked inspiration in his younger brother, Nikola. Growing up, Nikola Jokic was always oh. interested in basketball, but it was never really his calling. As we all know now, horses and horse racing are where his true passion lies. By the time really? Nikola had become a teenager, he was competing at the amateur level in horse racing. Pursuing That's where everybody be getting it from, because I thought it was just like an ongoing joke that like Nuggets fans especially would be saying about Jokic throughout the season. But no, he did as actually like horses. Sport as more than just a hobby. In interviews, Nikola has stated that growing up, racing was always a priority over basketball until he witnessed his brother's journey, his transition to the U.S., the connections he made, and the level he had reached in the sport, that for the first time, making a career out of basketball materialized into a possibility for a young Nikola Jokic. And so at 14 years old, Nikola made the decision to forego any aspirations of becoming a horse racer and put all of his efforts into basketball. Now 15 years, three MVPs, and an NBA championship later, turns out that was probably the right decision. If it wasn't for Darko opening his doors for an old friend from Serbia, That's Nikola's crazy. brother may have opted out of college in the States. He may have stayed home and pursued other interests as his only real tangible avenue post high school was at Detroit Mercy. He would have never made the difficult transition to America. His collegiate and pro career in hoops may have never happened. The inspiration he gave to his younger brother would have gone in a completely different direction. And we may have never gotten one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Leading up to the time he was drafted, and even recently, Darko has given words of wisdom, encouragement, and advice to Nikola Jokic, continuing to be a valuable friend to the Jokic family, long after he helped Nemanja nearly two decades ago. After 10 years in the NBA, Darko Milicic retired a champion with 10 solid seasons to his name. He never shook the label as being the guy that shouldn't have been drafted second overall in one of the greatest draft classes ever. And although he never gave fans quite what they were expecting coming into the league, he gave us something a whole lot better. One of the greatest players to ever touch a basketball. This is Mario Eli, former guard for the Houston Rockets, and he's on path to winning his first NBA championship. This is Danny Ainge, and he's not happy about it. But this second round matchup between the Rockets and the Suns in the 1994 playoffs was heated right from the jump. Coming off a finals appearance in the previous season, the Suns were being pushed to the brink by a tough, up-and-coming Rockets team. The Suns took the first two games of the series, but in Game 3, Houston completely blitzed them in a 16-point blowout. But in the midst of these games, a smaller battle was taking place between Mario Eli and Danny Ainge. Tensions were building as the play got more and more physical, Damn. neither of them willing to budge leading to this moment towards the end of game three. An exclamation point on a blowout win. This was Mario's third bucket bro, of the Bro, people be wanting to talk about like crash outs of like today, bro. Like, bro, the father of them all is the 70s and 80s niggas, bro. <laughs> like, bro, it just looked like some of these dudes who just woke up ready to just get down with anybody, bro. Like Three, an exclamation point on a blowout win. Like, how can this you even be that bad? This was Mario's third bucket of the entire game. And yet that didn't stop him from letting Ainge hear every single detail about it. But with the Rockets up double digits and time winding down, this game was far too out of reach for Ainge and the Suns to change the outcome. So instead, a few plays later, Ainge does something that would change the course of NBA history. This game is going to wind down to a whimper for Phoenix. Elijah Wan putting the cherry on the Sunday. 118 to 102. Whoa. The cherry on the Sunday. 118 to 102. 
Damn! Oh! Bro, that was like a 20, 200 a mile per hour. An In a moment of frustration, 200 Danny mile per hour fastball. I can't beat him. I'll just hurt him. The man zips a fastball right at Mario, hitting him directly in the face. Damn. He then proceeds to play it off like it was an accident. Ange took the low road Try to and play the victim? guy when his guard was down. And this one decision changed the direction of this entire series. If the win in Game 3 didn't give the Rockets enough motivation, seeing their teammate get sniped by a notoriously <laughs> dirty player was enough to get them going. Little did Ange know, this decision would have much greater ramifications. Because watching all of this take place was this guy, Robert Ori, a.k.a. Big Shot Bob, a.k.a. the man with more rings than Michael Jordan. And Ori was appalled by Ainge's actions. So much so that from this day forward, Ori despised Ainge and his dirty tactics. Years later, Ori even went as far as saying he hates Danny Ainge, and he wasn't afraid to let everyone know it. Fortunately for him, the next season, Danny Ainge retired from the NBA, where he could no longer bother Ori or anyone else. Until wow. the Phoenix Suns hired him to be the assistant coach the very next season in 1996. <laughs> Betty, Betty. But the changes within the Suns organization that year did not end with the coaching staff. They were also looking to part ways with their superstar, Charles Barkley. So on August 19th, 1996, just three months after Ainge's hire, Phoenix traded away Barkley to the Houston Rockets for Sam Cassell, Chucky Brown, Mark Bryant, and Robert Ory. Two years after that fateful inbounds pass, the guy who Ori hated so much was now his coach. And as you might wow. expect, this did not last very long. Ugh. Despite their now professional relationship, Ori was not going to hide his feelings about Ainge. Practices were heated, games were even worse. And just 30 games into his time with the Suns, Ori's disdain for Ainge was put on full display for the world to see. Damn. On Sunday night, he did this to his coach, Danny Ainge. In a moment infamously known as the towel throw, Robert Ory tosses a sweaty towel in Ainge, his coach's face, completely dismissing him in the process. Look at the disgust on Ory's face. Nah, but that's wild. He really though. did hate that man. And in that moment, there was absolutely nothing Ainge could do about it. What punishment could possibly be enough for such an action? After serving a two-game suspension for the towel episode, Robert Ory was supposed to be back in the Phoenix uniform tonight. Instead, he's L.A. bound. 72 Damn. hours later, Robert Ory was no longer on the Suns. An unbelievable coincidence of a transaction, considering Ainge said the trade had nothing to do with it's the crazy, towel crazy, because Robert Ory went on to average 5.2 points per game, one rebound, and he get eight championships, bro, after, like... The no, team seriously. Ory was traded to? A young, rising team in the Los Angeles Lakers, who signed Shaquille O'Neal and drafted Kobe Bryant just six months prior. And it was in LA where Ori would grow his legend as one of the biggest clutch shot makers in NBA history. Shots that were the deciding factor in championships and plays that solidified the legacies That's of both Shaq all he did. He and shook Kobe the ball one during time, their three-peat. If Danny Ainge doesn't rifle a pass at Mario Ellie, Robert Ori never grows to hate the man. There's no tension between the two of them. Ori never throws the towel, and he never gets shipped off to the Lakers. Completely altering and very possibly preventing a three-peat championship. Damn. Half a so that means Iverson technically would have got a ring if that never happened. Because they're trying to say that Ori was basically like... Yeah. All of this because Mario Ellie got a tough bucket and Ainge had to crash out in the final moment. Damn, so Danny Ainge is the reason why Iverson doesn't have a championship ring. That's playoff crazy. Playoff game man. that was already decided. Years later, Robert was asked if he regretted throwing the towel or if he would change anything about that incident. A changed man, Robert said, yeah, of course. If he could do it all over again, he would have thrown a brick. And that <laughs> is the butterfly effect. When one person's actions spur a series of events that leads he has to, to get something a gold threat much, badge for that one, a much bigger. All right, hey, there's a lot of interesting topics and storylines on this one. I actually like these types of styles and the way Jimmy Howell did this right here. It's like you get three, you know what I'm saying, exclusive many stories that, you know what I'm saying, never heard before. That Storm story in the beginning was actually the most insane sports you know, I'm story that I've probably ever heard. Out of every one of these guys, which one was the most uh, craziest out of all of them?